There are always three speeches for every one that you gave. The one you practiced, the one you gave, and the one you wish you gave. Dale Carnegie. Kelly Coughlin is CEO of Bank Boson, a management consulting firm helping bank C-level officers navigate risk and discover reward. He's the host of the syndicated audio podcast, BankBoson.com. Kelly brings over 25 years of experience with companies like PwC, Lloyds Bank, and Merrill Lynch. On the podcast, Kelly interviews key executives in the banking ecosystem to provide bank C-suite officers risk management, technology, and investment ideas and solutions to help them navigate risks and discover reward. And now your host, Kelly Coughlin. Greetings, this is Kelly Coughlin, CEO of Bank Boson, helping bank C-suite execs navigate risk and discover reward in a sea of threats and opportunities. You know, I don't think there is any bank executive that is exempt from giving some sort of public presentation on a recurring basis, whether it's small groups, medium size, or large audiences, whether it's motivating staff to be productive, informing your board of your financial results, persuading the big commercial loan or wealth management prospect to trust you, your bank, and your people. As much as we all wish we could have competed in the NFL or NHL and use our athletic skill to compete, we executives use our brains, words, and voice to compete. And if we are terrible at it and hate it, it's a curse. But if we like it, and are good at it, it's a huge benefit. My goal is to help you love it, or at least not hate it. And that leads me to two somewhat opposing quotes. The first from Dionysius of Halicarnassus, who taught rhetoric, that speech, in Greece during the reign of Caesar Augustus. And the second quote's from Mark Twain. I think you all know him. First, Dionysius, let thy speech be better than silence or be silent. I'm going to repeat that. Let thy speech be better than silence or be silent. And then Mark Twain said, There are only two types of speakers in the world. One, the nervous, and two, liars. I don't think I need to restate that. These two quotes, plus my intro, lay the foundation for the importance of good public speaking. Everyone is nervous, every exec must do it, and you best be good at it if you want to compete and win. I recently read a great book a while back titled Speak So Your Audience Will Listen, Seven Steps to Confident and Authentic Public Speaking. I also listened to the audiobook. I suggest you all get both the audiobook and the written book. The author is Robin Kermode. I encourage all of you to sign up on his website at zone2, that's the number two, zone2.co.uk zone2.co.uk Robin is also a professional actor interestingly he overcame his public speaking fear one time by appearing totally nude on a stage in England one word comes to my mind shrinkage in his book Robin refers to the Greeks and Aristotle the Romans and Cicero and the Irish with Joyce and Yates my four daughters will attest that the Greeks Romans and Irish are my three favorite topics and Joyce and Yeats are my two favorite writers. In fact, Robin even referenced one of my favorite poems by Yeats, The Stolen Child. And since this might be the only time I can use that poem in business, I'm going to use it now. To and fro we leap and chase the frothy bubbles, whilst the world is full of troubles and is anxious in its sleep. Come away, O human child, to the waters and the wild, with a fairy hand in hand, for the world's more full of weeping than you can understand. So there it is. After 25 years in business, I finally was able to use Yates. So when I read a book whose author used Yates and the Stolen Child and appeared naked on the stage to overcome his fear of public speaking, I decided I need to talk to that man. So with that in mind, I hope I have Robin on the phone. Robin, are you there? I'm right here. As long as you can hear me clearly, I can hear you great. I can hear you terrific. Thanks. How are you doing today? Very good indeed. It's a lovely sunny day here in London, so um, uh, all's good. Great. So, Robin, really naked on the stage to overcome fear of public speaking? Why don't we use that as the opening to introduce yourself and give us a brief bio with a keen focus on your unique tactic to overcome fear of public speaking? (laughs) Well, this is a slight uh, misconception there. Um, I wasn't appearing nude on a West End stage to overcome my fear of public speaking. I had to appear nude in a West End stage because that was um, contractual as part of the show that I was, was starring in at the time. But it was interesting what it 
does when you stand there being that vulnerable and obviously all uh, the men listening and probably the women listening as well could understand you couldn't feel more exposed if you tried and I felt that once I'd done that that nothing in terms of standing up in front of an audience doing anything really was going to be that difficult. I talked to lots of people who'd done it before and they came up with various suggestions put it that way as to how to feel comfortable (laughs) some of which worked and some of which didn't. Um, In the end I decided that the best thing to do was actually just to be there because ultimately you are who you are and most of the people in the audience are sitting there thank god it's you know saying thank god it's not me up there that got me through through that one but i got into the public speaking arena about 15 years ago when a friend of mine who was a ceo said would you help me on my big agm speech i said of course i said run it by me so i helped him and afterwards he said this is this is really useful stuff and i said but i'm only teaching you things that actors know instinctively he said yes but you seem to have an ability to be able to explain to somebody who's not a performer how to hold an audience and how to connect with an audience so for the last 15 years i've been been coaching in the last probably 5 years i suppose i've been working with senior ceos and boards across the world and with senior politicians and things i, I was on virgin radio recently in in london i was talking about body language and particularly in relation to Trump actually just before the election and they said so Robin you work with uh, these politicians what is it you teach them I said well I suppose if I'm allowed to say it on air I teach them not to be a dick really and by that what I mean is I teach them to be authentic in other words is the person that we're hearing or listening to or seeing on stage if we met them afterwards would they be exactly the same or would they be slightly different and if they're being exactly the same then there is an authenticity and a congruence into what they're they're doing and what they're saying great that's terrific the first question I have relates to nerves Robin, in your book, you talk about the body signals that appear before many people give a talk. Dry mouth, shaking, fast heartbeat. And you describe that many of these signals are related to the the seven flight responses to threats and fears the body Mm -hmm. goes through. Tell us Mm -hmm. about the top five internal fears and five external fears, and then your top tip of the day related to dealing with those. Okay, well, nerves affect our body on, on, as you say, on a fight or flight basis. The body feels under attack and the body and the subconscious brain is saying run. And of course, you can't run because you have to give the talk. So what the brain does is it prepares you to run. And obviously, then it sends adrenaline through the blood and oxygen uh, to the legs and the arms so that you can run. But that takes the blood away from your head. It tends to make your eyes a bit starey and a dry mouth, as you say, and the normal shaking and all these sort of things. Now, I would be very surprised if anyone says they don't have any nerves at all. And actually, a little nerves can be quite good, actually, because they can they can help to focus you. But as you alluded to there, the common internal fears are fear of forgetting our words. So obviously, there's the fear of, of blank, completely blanking out. And partly that's because the blood is being sent to the legs and the arms so that you can run, which means you have less blood in your head. So that's partly why when we're at job interviews or in pressured situations, it seems to go blank. The fear of being judged is another. There's a fear of large audiences for some people. Some people say, they're fine around a boardroom table if they can see everybody but if they, once they get to a point where they can't actually focus on people's eyes it, it feels like one one mass there's also fear of panicking if it happened last time there's a fear that well maybe it's going to happen again so i think that if people have had a bad experience i think that sometimes stays with them then there's also the fear of looking nervous so if we feel that we're shaking or we're showing any nerves by blushing or our voice is slightly cracking all the things that happen when we fight or flight responses then i think people worry that people will be able to see the nerves so we don't look quite as in control, quite as much as a leader as we would like to look. And then there are obviously external fears that are really outside our control, things like the importance of the outcome of the speech, the size of the audience, even the venue. Is it somewhere that you know or is it a venue that you don't know at all? And that's another fear. There's also the fear of how the audience will react. You know, if we see one person yawning, often we think that everybody's bored and so we start speeding up. If I see somebody's yawning in an audience, I tend to think, well, they probably had a late night or maybe they've had a newborn baby or something. If I see 30 people yawning, I probably think it's too hot in the room maybe or it's just after lunch. And I think if I see everybody yawning, then I change my plan. External fears are really externally triggered, but they are all internally responded to. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely, yeah. And obviously, so we have a fear of something going wrong and all 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 these things. And then if if you plan something meticulously and then the, for example, I was working with a friend of mine on a, a wedding his wedding speech last year and we wrote this wonderful speech it was just it was really beautiful and it was exactly what you want in a wedding speech it had all the the right balance of humor and pathos and emotion and everything and love as you'd expect on the day unfortunately on the evening the he hadn't checked out the light so that he wasn't able to read the speech because the light wasn't there and so he slightly went to pieces because this perfect speech that he had practiced didn't go quite as he expected and then of course the panic takes over on on the night you know and i always say to people check out the space beforehand check out how long it takes you from the side of the stage to the podium the 
the, the size of the auditorium, what it looks like when you're there. Does the microphone work? Do the lights work? All these sort of things. Give us your top tip of the day to deal with these. <laughs> okay. Ultimately, the fight or flight response is basically saying run. Now, obviously, as we've established, we can't run. This is going to sound very odd, but I promise you it works. And I've given this to so many politicians and I, and I can see them doing this. It is physically impossible to shake if you squeeze your buttocks or your thighs. Now, I don't mean squeeze them with your hands, obviously. I mean clenching them. So, so clench the muscles. And there's a science behind this. The reason it works is the muscles are being told to move. The big muscle groups, the buttocks and the, and the thighs. If you contract the muscles, the brain says, ah, okay, you're doing what I want you to do, which is to run. So it stops producing adrenaline. Now, if it stops producing adrenaline, of course, the whole cycle tends to stop. You don't shake anymore. The reason we shake is that the muscles are overloaded with oxygen. They're not doing what you want them to do. But if you actually contract them, all that tension is used up and you stop shaking. So it's physically impossible to shake. You also, by squeezing the big muscle groups there, you squeeze blood back up to the brain. So you have much less chance of going blank. And there's one other thing it does as well, which I'm very keen on. This is on how we can look confident and how confident people look. There's confidence and charisma and there's confidence and arrogance. And there's a fine line between confidence and arrogance. People think that confidence is a possibly slightly old fashioned, you know, shoulders back, head up, walk into the room, you know, talk deep, talk strong, this type of thing. And that is, of course, it's a confident way of behaving. It's not necessarily the best way to connect with an audience or to, to make an audience feel special. And that's where charisma comes in. So confidence ultimately is about you and charisma is about the audience, is about what they feel about you. Charisma is about making the audience feel special. And the the definition of charisma is actually gift of grace. So it's actually about making other people feel special. And if you think of the people that we would call charismatic, like Obama or, or Clinton, all over the world, if I ask people who their most you know, charismatic people are, that they would probably come up with those two, actually. I've never met Bill Clinton, but friends of mine who have said that he makes you feel incredibly special when you're with them. And I'm sure Mandela did the same. I'm sure these wonderfully charismatic people, they have a way of making you feel very, very special. In other words, they don't have to make it about them. They're so confident in who they are themselves, they don't have to make it about them. I was working with the CEO of one of the big four supermarkets in the UK uh, recently, and the head of HR phoned me up and said, can we have a pre-meeting? And I said, to what outcome? And she said, well, we need to decide what you're going to do, and then you'll have time to do it. You've only got this guy for two hours. He's very busy. And I said, okay, no, I'll meet him and I'll decide then what I'm going to do with him. And she said, but by the time you've decided what to do, there'll be no time to do it. And I said, how long do you think it's going to take me to work out what I'm going to do? And she said, well, probably 40 minutes, I don't know, 45 minutes, maybe by the time you've had a chat with him, which only leaves you just over an hour. I said, it will take me exactly eight seconds to work out what the problem is. And that's about the amount of time it takes for somebody to walk into the door, across the room, shake your hand and sit down. And the issues normally are how comfortable somebody is in their own skin. If we want to look comfortable in our own skin, that's how we look confident. If we feel we're trying too hard, we're trying to make a point, we're trying to justify, these are people who want to look confident. These are the wannabes. The really confident people are just confident in their own skin. One of the simplest ways to look confident in your own skin when you don't feel it, weirdly, is to squeeze your buttocks or your thighs because it lowers your center of gravity. And I worked out a few years ago that really confident people have a low center of gravity. When I first meet someone, I look at a couple of things. But one of the first things I look at is where is their center of gravity? Because that will tell me how comfortable they are. And so the center Center of gravity should be in the lower gut, that's below the belly button, in the lower gut. And if people have a center of gravity there, they look comfortable in their own skin, and they will therefore look more confident. What they then have to do is to structure their message in such a way that they make it about the audience, and they make the audience feel incredibly special. And that's where charisma comes in. That kind of connects to authenticity. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting concept. Being your authentic, true self in private is easy for all of us, I would say. Mm -hmm. But being ourselves in public or in a business environment where or either informing or selling or motivating mm -hmm. or persuading or creating mm -hmm. controversy. I think those are the main reasons to be speaking. That's a whole different ballgame. I would assume you're going to advise us all to be our authentic self all the time. But how do we do that? when our authentic self isn't always to be informing, selling, motivated, et cetera, to people we don't know very well and who don't know us very well. Isn't the absence of that relationship causing this inauthentic self to rear its ugly head? It's possible. It can do, Kelly. But sometimes it's as, it's as simple as actually not quite knowing what your authentic self is. And that, that sounds like I, I run therapy sessions, which I don't, I don't particularly with, with clients. But there is something about finding your own voice. And I think when people find their own 
own voice, suddenly they can connect to their own authenticity and they suddenly feel like they believe what they're saying. I mean, they, they might believe it, but they actually, they can hear themselves saying something in a particular way. And it's to do with where their voice is placed, interestingly enough. You don't mean literal voice, do you? Find your own literal voice? I do actually mean the literal voice, yeah. I, I mean, it's where the voice is coming from. It's not about having a perfect accent. It's not about anything like that. It's about the timbre of the voice and where the voice is placed. We were taught as young actors, if you want an audience to believe you, whatever you're saying, you you have to speak from your emotional center. And the emotional center is the same place as what I referred to earlier, which is the center of gravity, which is actually your core. So anything like yoga, martial arts, Pilates, all that stuff comes from a strong core, your lower gut below the belly button. And if your thoughts come from there, if you can speak from your lower gut, so very relaxed with an open throat, then it sounds like you believe what you're saying. And interestingly enough, people's nerves tend to disappear when they find they speak from their emotional center. Most people speak on their throat, which is what I call the power. PowerPoint voice. And if, if I could show you the difference now. So this voice here is fairly relaxed voice. I'm speaking, obviously the throat is making the sound because the air goes over the vocal cords like a reed on a clarinet, but the power comes from lower down from the gut. And actually the emotions come from the gut there. So the, the, the throat itself is not actually manufacturing the sound. It's just allowing the sound to come out. If I manufacture the sound on my throat like that, that's the sound that um, is now emotionally disconnected because I'm now speaking on my throat. And most people, when they present, speak in this tone here, which is a slightly teacherish sound. And most people will say, they're looking at a PowerPoint screen, they'll say, so if you look at the screen, if you look at the bottom left-hand side of the screen, and this now is rather a tight, controlling sound. It's not anywhere like the sound that is authentic. So I always say to people, look, if you can speak to your children like this, then you can speak to your customers like this, you can speak to your clients like this. This sound is much less controlling. Audiences don't want to be controlled. They might want to be led, but they don't want to be controlled. And I think it starts for me with where people's voice are placed. I do quite a lot of exercises in the book around this. And obviously, when I'm working with clients one to one, I would work very much on, first of all, on where their voice is. And I think if you get the voice right, actually, people start to feel much less nervous because they can hear that their voice sounds authentic and it sounds real. And that's what we're after. Yeah, I will uh, put a plug in for your book. I think you have some really good tips and, and exercises to go through that we obviously can't go over here. One of the thoughts that you have is on this concept of the connection. You talk about the three zones of communication and uh -huh. you maintain that all of us, speaker and uh -huh. audiences, each have their own zone one and two. And then there's this zone three. Tell us about these three zones and why is it important for a speaker to be aware of their zone one and two? And I suppose when they enter into this zone three that I think yeah. we don't want people to go in, correct? I think that's correct. Yeah. I mean, it's a very simple concept I came up with a few years ago. My wife said to me, she's a CEO and I, I used to come back to her after going to initial meetings to get new clients when I was starting up as a, as, as a coach. And as an actor, you imagine you, you have an agent to do these things for you. And I suddenly had to learn a new skill. And I'd come back to her at the end of these meetings and I'd say, you know, it's really interesting because some meetings go well and some meetings don't go well. And I can't quite seem to, to, to shift some of them. And I couldn't, I couldn't work it out. And eventually I came up with this concept of the three zones of communication. Very, very simple, but it's absolutely changed my life. And, and since coming up with this, which was about 15 years ago, I promise you I have not had one bad meeting in that time, simply by using this very, very simple technique. So if you can imagine that you have three circles around your body, the closest circle around your body is your zone one. This is your personal space where you choose not to connect with someone else. Zone two is a slightly wider zone. This is where you choose to connect with somebody. Now, these zones, of course, are metaphorical. They don't exist, but it's like an image in your head of, am I actually trying consciously not to connect with somebody or am I trying to connect with them? So in, in a shop scenario, the easiest example is, you know, you go into a, a clothes shop and the salesman then goes into zone two to connect with the customer and says, you know, can I help you? And the customer probably says, actually, I just want to browse. I want to look around, leave me alone. What they're saying is they want to stay in zone one. In other words, I don't want to connect with you at this moment. So a good salesman, of course, physically backs away at that point and they say, you know, no problem, I'll be over here, give me a shout if you want me, that type of thing. But they, they pull away. In other words, they're not pressurizing the zone one person. And I think this is one of the fundamental mistakes that speakers make is they try to push too hard with an audience that's not ready to connect with them. So there are stages to how you win an audience round. It, when I was a young actor doing stage plays in London, if on a wet Friday night when the audience weren't particularly responsive on a, on a comedy, and it's very obvious on a comedy, if you don't get your laughs, you can see it's not working. The temptation is to go louder and faster because you think I'm 
I'm going to wake this audience up. But actually, it's the worst thing you can do. And what you have to do with a zone one audience who are choosing for whatever reason, not connecting with you, and they're allowed to, you have to take your pace down and your energy level down and basically make it more real and allow them to come to you. So that's the zone one. So in the shop scenario, salesman says, can I help you? And the customer says, no, leave me alone. That's what they do. If the customer says, yeah, I'm looking for a blue jacket in size, whatever, then the salesman knows that they're in zone two because they've chose to connect with them. So when the customer's zone two and the salesman's zone twos overlap, then of course, that's where we, we want to be. So ideally, when we're talking to people, we want to get them to choose to connect with us. But there's a zone three and the zone three is a wider zone. And the zone three is basically where you invade their space. So the customer's zone one is actually the same as the salesman's zone three. So the salesman that says, can I help you? And the customer says, no, leave me alone. And the salesman then invades the space and says, no, no, come on, try this jacket on now. It's quite annoying when that happens because you've said very clearly, I want just to be left alone and they don't. They invade your space. So that's the zone three. The reason this is useful when you're public speaking or presenting is that you've got an audience who will be a mixture of zone one, twos and threes. So there are some people in the audience who for whatever reason are there, but they're they're not particularly connected with you yet. There are the zone two people who are up for it and they're sitting on the front of their seats and they're they're interested. And then you have the zone three people who think they know it all. They're the ones who are going, well, I don't really know why I'm here because actually I know know this stuff anyway. This is, you know, who who is this Muppet? So there's a bit of that. What we have to do is we've got to encourage all of them to come into zone two, but we have to treat them differently. The zone one people, we have to take our energy down a little bit. The zone two people are easy because we have a little bit of banter with them. It's fine. And I would suggest with the zone three people, a guy was was coaching. Um, He phoned me up actually, and uh, I I won't do it too loud down the microphone, but he had a very, very loud voice. And I answered the phone and I said, hello. And I have to be in zone two. And zone two is a calm, open space. So I answer my telephone. Of course, it's my business phone. So I said, hello. And he said, is that Robin? I said, yes. And he said, I promise you, these are the exact words he used. He said, the thing is, Robin, he said, uh, I'm an entrepreneur, just sold my company for 45 million pounds. I have 45 million pounds in the bank, actually. He said, and I want to go on the speaking circuit because the world needs to know how much money I've made. But okay, well, we could look at the messaging around that maybe. But we booked in a session and he came in and he was so loud. The handshake was over firm. He was sort of trying to dominate the whole situation. This is classic zone three controlling behavior. Now, my job, of course, is to get him into zone two. I have to try to encourage him into zone two. You can't push anyone. And I thought, why is this man who has apparently 45 million pounds in the bank. Why does he feel the need to tell me that he's selling his Aston Martin and, and control the meeting in this way? Why does he need to do that? So I thought, well, he's probably doing this because he needs some sort of affirmation from me. It's, it's rather like a seven-year-old child who says to their parents, you know, look at me, mum, I'm diving off the diving board. You know, it's the same thing. And he said, look at me, look how successful I am. So I thought I better just basically go, wow. But I thought, what's the cleverest way to go, wow, to this particular man? And I suddenly, without thinking about it, th- these words came out of my mouth and actually it worked. So he said, the thing is, Robin, he said, you know, I've got all this money in the bank. I'm selling my Aston Martin. I'm going to leave my phone on the whole time. I'm running this meeting. And I said, oh my God. I said, I'm sitting here with James Bond. And he said, yeah. And then he said, the thing is, Robin, I'm a bit nervous about making a speech. So you can see the psychology is very clear. He thinks I'm a very important man. And he said, but I don't really like to ask for help, but I have to ask for help for this man because I feel I need some help. But I, I'm only going to ask for help when he knows that I'm really important. And I went, oh my God, you're really important. He went, okay, now you know that. Now I'll show some vulnerability. So the psychology is very simple. But basically, if I meet zone three people, I flatter them. I was at dinner actually the other the night and there was a man who was going on and on about himself. I mean, really real zone three behavior. And after a while, I thought, I wonder if I how I could flatter this man to try to encourage him into two. This man was short, fat, and bald. He didn't look like James Bond. He looked like a sort of Bond villain. So he's chatting away, and I stopped him mid-sentence. And I said, I said, look, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I said, but has anyone ever said, I said, you've got a bit of a look of James Bond about you. He said, you've seen the real me, haven't you? Now, the interesting thing is that zone three people have no level of self-irony. If you flatter a zone one person, they'll hate it. If you flatter a zone two person, you're going to get some banter back. But if you flatter a zone three person in the right way, they'll always take it. When we have a mixed audience, we have to make sure we have a mixture of flattery a mixture of taking the energy down a little bit so we don't frighten the horses with the zone one people and a little bit of banter with the zone two people. So we have that mixture of of there. And if I'm at a a business meeting around, say, a boardroom table with maybe half a dozen people, I look around and I think, okay, there's zone one man there, there's a zone two lady there, a couple of zone threes over there. And I make sure a little bit of flattery goes towards the threes, a little bit of gentleness goes towards the ones. I won't sort of eyeball them too much, but I'll maybe finish an idea with them, but I won't hold their eye contact too long to frighten them. And the zone two people, I'll probably have a little bit more 
banter a bit with. And that way, you can help encourage everyone in the meeting to come into their zone two. And if you can get everyone into zone two, including the whole of your audience, you're home and dry. Is empathy and trying to move people to equal status, is that what you're doing there? It is part of that. I said to my kids the other day, look, I said, they're in their you know, late teens. I said, if you go through life making other people feel special, life is so easy. I said, but if you go through life saying, look at me, I'm important, they just want you to fall on the banana skin. That's what it's about. A bit of empathy, a bit of kindness, a bit of noticing other people will get you a long way. And I always think with an audience, for example, so one, one of the flattering ways with a zone three audience is if you're, gonna, if you're going to explain a concept, there are some people in the audience who may know that concept and there are some who possibly don't. I would favor a, a phrase like, of course, as you know, and then you go on to tell them anyway. So the ones who do know are flattered that you've told them that you know, and the ones who don't know are pleased that you've told them. So you, you somehow get all levels on that. But if you stand there and you say, I've seen speakers stand in front of quite an important audience and they'll say things like, you probably don't know this, but and I thought you've just alienated half the audience who did know that. Much better to say, of course, as you know, and flatter the audience into assuming that they might know, even if they don't. So I think equal status is very, very important. And I think that also comes with tone of voice. I sit quite often watching speakers with my wife and she finds it quite annoying, but a speaker will come onto stage and they will literally say, good evening or whatever the time of day is. From those two words, I will go, oh no, it's going to be terrible. Or I'm going to go, oh, this is going to be good. And I can tell from the first two words how it is. And it's to do, in those two words, it's to do with where their voice is placed, where their status is, uh, how much charisma they have. In other words, are they saying genuinely good evening? Uh, Are they actually concerned that I'm there? It's what I call how you show up. It's literally what you bring to the table, what you walk on with. And audiences, even if they're not qualified or specialized in reading body language, on a gut level, they will know, I like this person, or I don't know, I trust this person. And that's what we're trying to do. And that's what I work with with clients is to get them to a point where they're comfortable in their own skin and they come across with equal status and, and they speak from their emotional center with authenticity. Okay. I want to explore this empathy and equal status just a bit more. Tell me if I have this right. Empathy requires us to at least acknowledge and recognize that we have people in zone one and zone mm-hmm. three. Zone mm-hmm. two, we're fine with. Of and course. then we have these different tactics mm-hmm. that help us try to get them moved from zone one and three to zone two to bring mm-hmm. them to equal status with us. That's absolutely true. And we have to get them to choose to do that. You can't, you can't yes. hurt anyone. You can't push them. They have to choose to do that. If they've got themselves into zone three, and often, by the way, it's, they're not bad people. It's often nerves that make people into, into zone three. So when there's networking events that many people say they just they don't like, so they walk into a room full of people with badges on and glasses of wine, and they go, there's a whole room of people I don't know, and I have to somehow to make an impression. The reason those networking events don't work is you've got an entire room of zone threes. Everyone has become zone three. Not, they're not necessarily bad people. They've just work, got themselves in this position where they think to hand out cards and make contacts and whatever. I, I walk into a networking room now, and I look at the room, and I think, okay, here's a lot of very uncentered people who are not really very comfortable with being in this place. So if I can go in and make, say, five people this evening feel really comfortable, then in a sense, I've done my job and I've probably connected with them. So I will basically go up to someone and I'll say, if they're they're in zone three, I'll find something that that I can flatter them about. And maybe, for example, it might be something like um, if I discover that they're a CEO of a company or their entrepreneur, I'll say, I said, you're incredibly young to have done that. It's amazing. You know, so whatever it might be, it's whatever's appropriate. I'll say something. I said, what is it? The word love in the second sentence always. I said, what is it you love about being an entrepreneur? What is it you love about starting your own company? And by putting in the word love there, what happens is their voice changes immediately and they say, do you know what? Actually, and whatever, whatever their answer is. And suddenly they're now having a normal conversation as opposed to a quotes networking conversation, because what we're doing is we're having a proper conversation. The implication is I could see you being in zone three, not being very comfortable in zone three. When you're with me, I'm so impressed. You, d- you don't have to impress me anymore. We can just have a normal conversation. And it's so relaxing for them because they don't, very few people do that. What most people do is they join them in zone three. So you have a, a zone three person saying, I'm important. And the other person who's also at a networking event feels they should big themselves up away and, and say at the same time, say, yes, well, it's very good. So I'm quite important too, you know. And it's a bit like those conversations where you see somebody's got a, a suntan and you say, oh, have you just come back from holiday? And they say, yes, I've just come back from the Bahamas or somewhere and they say, oh, right, because we just come back from the Jamaica or whatever. And, and what they're doing is they're not really asking a question about their holiday. They're almost looking for an excuse to get their holiday and to make themselves feel important. But I think if we, if we fight that urge and we just go, wow, it's amazing. So, you know, what is it you love about the Bahamas? Suddenly you can have a proper conversation with these people and then they choose to join you in zone two. So it's about noticing them ultimately in the zone threes. Now you're going to ask about the zone ones. Um, what we want to do with the zone ones is it, it's just literally, it's not frightening the horses. It's treating them like, like somebody in a shop who's saying, I just want to browse. So what you do is you tease them with the carrot. So I'll maybe have a thought and I'll finish my thought 
on the, on them. I sort of turn to them right towards the end of the thought and I'll have eye contact with them just on the end of it so it lands and then I'll move away. I'm not waiting long enough for a response so they don't feel under attack but they do feel included and gradually they will come to join you. You can't ignore them because that doesn't work and you don't want to eyeball them too much. So you could probably hold eye contact longer with a zone two person because they'll probably be smiling away at you. You know, And of, often, I don't know if you've had this, Kelly, but when you're giving a talk, it's very easy to give an entire talk to three people because towards the front of the hall, you can find three very open faces who are nodding and smiling and, and, you, know, and you think, oh, they're nice. I'll come back to them. I'm feeling a bit vulnerable. So I'll go back to these nice people. And I used to think these are people that were loving it. But actually, I've now discovered that those people are just people pleasers. So they love everybody. But I don't spend my time with those people. I think, OK, I want to try and win around the, the zone ones and the zone twos. And then I, then I know I've done it. Great. That's excellent. Great stuff. Robin, that's terrific. I really appreciate your time. How should people get in touch with you? Give us your, uh, I I presume, website, email address. How would you like to do that? Well, it it would be very lovely to hear from any any of your listeners, of course. Uh, uh, You can buy the book on Amazon, which is Speak So Your Audience Will Listen. Uh, You can contact me via the website, which is Zone2. That's the Z-O-N-E, the number two, zone2.co.uk. And my email is robin at zone2.co.uk. I look forward to hearing from you and, and, uh, and hearing um, how you're getting on with, with your presentations and your speeches. Great, Robin. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you so much, Kelly, for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, that concludes part one of my interview with Robin Kermode. I strongly encourage you to get his printed book and the audio book titled Speak So Your Audience Will Listen, Seven Steps to Confident and Authentic Public Speaking. They're terrific. In a week, we'll have part two of my interview with Robin, and we'll discuss things like where to put your hands, how to stand, the importance of smiling, and a really interesting five-step checklist you need to do before each of your presentations to up your game in public speaking. Thanks for listening. We want to thank you for listening to the syndicated audio program BankBoson.com. The audio content is produced and syndicated by Seth Green. Market domination with the help of Kevin Boyle. Video content is produced by the Guildmaster Studio, Keenan Bobson Boyle. Voice introduction is me, Kareem Cronfle. The program is hosted by Kelly Coughlin. If you like this program, please tell us. If you don't, please tell us how we can improve it. And now some disclaimers. Kelly is licensed with the Minnesota State Board of Accountancy as a certified public accountant. The views expressed here are solely those of Kelly Coughlin and his guest in their private capacity and do not in any way represent the views of any other agent, principal, employer, employee, vendor or supplier.